everyone, my name is Garvin and I read things and that are about them on the internet for your entertainment. Today we're looking at a historical person from the early Iron Age, a queen of the Assyrian Empire named Semiramis. Now, she also has an incredible mythology that has built up around her and we're going to discuss that. This video was voted on by my ever-wise patrons who had the option of telling me to ignore this topic or even make the video but just release it for patrons only. But because the Everwise are curious and generous folk, they voted that not only should I make this video, but I should make it available to everyone. So if you enjoy this video, be sure to leave a thank you in the comments to them. You can also join their ranks for just a dollar a month and vote on upcoming questions or even just leave a one-time donation if you prefer at my coffee account if you just want to support the channel. There are links in the description below. Now, let's take a look at this impressive woman. First, let's talk about the historical person before jumping into the mythology. Semiramis is believed to be based on Samu Ramat. She was, we think, an Akkadian, but there's nothing written about her origin. She was the primary consort and queen of the new Assyrian king Shamshi Adad IV, but not much is known about her here because our only source is a sacrificial bead with her name on it given to the goddess Ishtar by this king for her health and well-being. We have more attributed to her during the reign of her son, King Adad Nirari III. He seems to have been very young when he cooked the throne, so Samu Ramat is believed to have served as his regent for five years. Uh, this is disputed, but given that Samu Ramat is the only Assyrian lady known to keep her title as queen after her husband's death, this does seem the most sensible explanation. Uh, now, the archaeological evidence we have for her are mainly pillars and writings on walls attributing various feats to her name. For example, there's evidence that she went on at least one military campaign and is the only Assyrian queen or noblewoman we know of to do so. She's also inscribed on various works in the Assyrian capital, which traditionally only have the king listed. So clearly, this was a woman of influence and political power. The mythology, on the other hand, so these stories mainly come to us through Greek writers, the two biggest ones being Theodorus Siculus, known for his universal history called the Biblica Historica, I hope I got that pronunciation right, a 40-volume work, which unfortunately only 14 volumes survive. This is a reoccurring issue with ancient works. A lot of them just didn't get to the modern day intact. And I talk about that in one of my earlier videos, uh, go ahead and check that out. The other Greek writer is Tisias, who covered uh, Semiramis extensively in his work. Now, in Tisias's work, she is a demigoddess born to the goddess Atargatis, who I talked about in the first video. The Greeks also called her Derceto. As mentioned in the prior video, Derceto had angered Aphrodite, and because of that, Aphrodite cursed her to fall in love with a mortal, even though she was married to another god. So when Derceto gave birth to our heroine, that broke the curse, and she didn't react well. She killed her lover, who was a mortal shepherd, abandoned her daughter, dove into a lake, and became pretty much the first mermaid in a lot of ways. Semiramis would survive, however, sheltered by doves, until another shepherd, this guy being the royal shepherd, discovered her and adopted her. So she would grow up and marry the Syrian general Anis, and when Anis and his king, Ninus, were besieging the central Asian city of Bactria, Onias wrote to her for help. So she gathered a force and disguised herself, in the process inventing pants, and captured the city of Bactria, revealing herself, and oh no, the king fell in love with her. 
this becomes a problem. Ninus decides he can't live without Seomiramis, so he tries to threaten Anis into divorcing her, telling Anis, hey, if you don't divorce your wife, I'll blind you with a hot iron. This freaks out the general so badly that he hangs himself, or so the story goes. Ninus then marries Semiramis and fathers a son with her named Ninyas, and then he dies. Now, the story claims that he was just old and died of old age, but honestly, all things considered, I have suspicions. Because Semiramis already had two children with Anis, and was fond enough of her husband to come running a long distance to help him win a war. Listen, she's living in Syria. Bactria is in modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan, look at the map, figure out that distance, ask yourself how much you would have to like someone to travel that distance on foot or horseback and then fight a war for them. What I'm getting at is, this doesn't sound like a woman who would just shrug if some other guy killed her husband and then tried to climb into bed with her. But, you know, that's just my dark, suspicious thoughts, and it's not actually part of the mythology. Now, the account by Diodorus has Ninus as her first husband, and him dying by an arrow to the throat, and Semiramis, disguising herself, has her husband to command the army and win the war. So, you choose your favorite version there. Afterwards, she brings Ninus to Nineveh, and buries him in this super elaborate burial mound in both accounts. She then takes power on behalf of her son and goes on to conquer Libya and Ethiopia, as well as all of Asia, because why stop now? Keep in mind, for the Greeks, Asia was a smaller place. For some reason, just to give you an example, they didn't count China or Siberia as part of Asia. Anyways, she was fighting in India, but she was at a distinct disadvantage due to a lack of elephants in her army. So, she built fake elephants from the hides of black oxen stuffed with straw mounted on her army's camels, which freaked the Indians enough to make them retreat. Uh, she's also credited with being the founder of Babylon, or at least rebuilding it, and having palaces in the Persian city of Ekbatana. The Romans had an interesting view of her. They would credit her with creating the first eunuchs, castrating young men before taking them into her service. They also added the idea that her son killed her in order to take the throne for himself. The 2nd century AD writer Justin claimed that her son killed her because she was trying to seduce him. To be honest, the Romans just didn't seem to like powerful women and would not let any powerful woman in their history or mythology get a positive reputation or keep one if she already had it. Now, the Romans aren't the only ones writing negative things about her. The Arminians also have a negative tradition about her. In their stories, she is a wicked witch queen who falls in love with their legendary king, Ara the Beautiful. At first, she tries to woo him, sending him gifts, making offers of land, telling him that if she just marries her, he could be king of the Assyrian Empire. Ara refuses for various reasons, one of those I believe being that he was already married, and this enrages her. So she gathers the massive armies of the Assyrian Empire and attacks. She does instruct everyone that she wants Ara taken alive. But, of course, he dies in the fighting because that's how these stories go. This enrages the Arminians who are like, you come to our country, you wreck the joint, and you murder our king. What the heck, lady? And they wreak terrible carnage on the Assyrians. But Semiramis, thinking quickly, builds a tower hides Ara's body, disguises one of her followers to looks like him, slaps him up on the top of the tower where no one can get a good look, and just says, I have forced the gods 
through my magical powers to bring King Aura to life. This confuses everyone long enough for her to make a getaway. She's also then credited with building the city of Van on the shores of Lake Van to be her summer palace, and placing Aura's then 12-year-old son on the throne of Armenia has a oops, sorry about that bro kind of apology move. Her depiction would continue to have some negative turns in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Dante, for example, placed her in the second circle of hell as an example of someone guilty of the sin of lust. Uh, medieval and early Renaissance writers seem to enjoy using her as an example of a lustful, faithless woman. This continued up into the 1800s. In 1853, the minister Alexander Hislop tried to claim she was the wife of Nimrod the Hunter in the Bible, and even claimed she invented goddess worship and polytheism in general to deceive humanity and lead them away from God. Uh, so, let me be clear here. Semiramis is not in the Bible. She is not a biblical character. So, this guy came up with this out of whole cloth. And it was part of this big anti-Catholic conspiracy mongering movement that claimed that the Roman Catholic Church was really a conspiracy to bring back the religion of ancient Babylon and destroy Christianity. And only Protestant churches could save us all. Which, look, I am a Protestant Christian and that's absurd. I, I, I'll be honest. I have Catholic friends, I enjoy, uh, you know, teasing them a little bit, you know, pointing out that it's really weird that their church is a hierarchy of hats, but, I mean, just, just first of all, if the Catholic church was run by a conspiracy to destroy Christianity and bring back the ancient Babylonian pagan religion, You've had over 1,500 years to do this. How have you failed to do this in 1,500 years? How bad at your job do you have to be to fail to destroy what you're trying to do to destroy and instead preserve it for over a 1,000 years? That's, that's how stupid this idea is. I'm sorry. It's just, it's ridiculous. M moving on, sorry about that. Semiramis is written of positively in the medieval and renaissance uh, eras as well, though. Many writers list her as one of the nine great worthy women of history. So, there's never what I would c consider a unified depiction of her in the Western tradition. In the 1800s, for example, she shows up in plays and poems, often has a tragic figure. Voltaire wrote a tragedy titled Semiramis. She also appeared in the 1954 film Queen of Babylon and the 1963 film I Am Semiramis. These days, however, she seems to be a rather obscure figure, which is honestly kind of a shame because we did not really dig that deep, and we still found a lot of interesting color here, is what I'm going to throw out. Well, all ranting about absurd conspiracy theories aside, I hope you found this video informative, or at least entertaining. If so, please leave a like or a comment, or consider subscribing. All of these help me in my eternal struggle against the Dread Lord Algorithm. Terror beyond his name. Thank you for watching, and a special thanks to Big Steve, my biggest supporter. Join me Friday for part two of Divine Merfolk, where we look at the mermaid goddesses of Africa and the Americas, as well as the many, many divine merfolk of Greek myth. Until then, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and of course, keep reading.